Well, shall we get started to honor the time of folks who came right at the uh, bottom of the hour? Uh, good afternoon, or I think it's probably afternoon for everyone who's watching, unless you're in Alaska or Hawaii. Um, but welcome. My name is Risa Shimoda. I'm the Executive Director of the River Management Society, and I'm happy for you to be joining us this afternoon on um, the role of water quality monitoring, and it's the context in being efficient river management uh, professionals. So thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. I'm Angie Furman. I'm the River Training Center Coordinator for River Management Society. I'm going to be helping along with Risa, helping monitor the chat today in, uh, for the roundtable. And so um, for those who might not be familiar, river management roundtables are these virtual one-hour meetings that we hold once a month, usually on the second Tuesday of the month. And Really, our goal is to have some conversation and bring together people who work on and with rivers and water trails and green uh, greenways along rivers and planners and managers from uh, regional, state, federal levels, um, really just to facilitate an open forum where we can help support each other's work and where we can hopefully tackle some common issues and ask questions and share solutions. So thank you for joining us for today's roundtable. Just a couple of notes as we're getting started here. Um, we are recording and we will be sending this out uh, probably tomorrow morning or so once we get the recording processed. We also are going to be posting this recording to our YouTube channel. You can check it out uh, as well as check out any of our former river management roundtables. We have a whole playlist of them. We're going to have some time for questions and discussion today. Uh, in the meantime, we ask you to stay muted, but when we have time for a Q&A, you'll have the opportunity to come off mute and ask questions. And then we also have that chat box there. So feel free to use the chat box to communicate, type in any questions as they come up so that you don't forget them. Um, yeah, feel free to use that. And then, you know, just be respectful. So we're excited to hear from some people today. And in particular, I would like to introduce Laura Hart, who's joining us today from the Farmington River Watershed Association. And I'm going to pass it over to Laura to introduce herself and take it away. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, yes, I'm Laura Hart. I'm the Conservation Director for the Farmington River Watershed Association. Uh, we are a local nonprofit uh, that focuses on our watershed. It's one of the largest ones for the Connecticut River, uh, to put it in context. Um, unfortunately, my coworker, Paige, um, had a family matter and she last minute was not able to attend. Um, but the two of us and some others here at our office work very closely in collecting water quality data and sharing that with our partners. Um, so I'll speak to that and looking forward to hearing questions um, as well. So I'm just gonna give you a little overview of the Farmington River watershed. Um, our organization was actually established in 1953. Uh, the, the times then were very different in terms of river health and our Farmington River was very, very polluted. Obviously this was before the Clean Water Act um, but our organization has been around local citizens from the ground up trying to make a change. Um, and we also have not one, but two wild and scenic designations, partnership wild and scenic designations on our river. I believe there's a couple people that might be from some of the wild and scenic rivers on, on the meeting today too. Um, so that has also helped our programming. And then um, in terms of our kind of watershed management, um, you know, we look at it at the watershed scale, which can pose some challenges. It spans two states. So our headwaters are up in Massachusetts, um, which brings a whole different set of working with a different state agency, um, difference in funding for programs and everything like that. Um, and then the main part of our watersheds in Connecticut, it does provide drinking water for about a third of the state of Connecticut. Um, so very pristine waters coming in. Um, 
from our from our watershed and it flows all the way until it meets the confluence with the Connecticut River in Windsor, um, which then flows down into Long Island Sound. Um, so we also try to focus on not just our watershed, but the larger Connecticut River watershed and our impacts on Long Island Sound. Um, and some of that was also interesting because in Connecticut, um, there's a lot of regulations regarding nitrogen not so much for phosphorus with wastewater pollution facilities on our river. And in Massachusetts, it's the opposite. There's more focus on phosphorus reductions. Um, so I'll speak to that a little bit in, in a bit. Um, and then I don't know if, if the slides, are, are we able to jump to the next slide? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we are, as I mentioned, a small nonprofit. Um, we are staff of five, four full time. And then during the summer, we have two to three interns. Uh, we also have some long term volunteers that help us when we're actually out in the field collecting samples, bringing it to our lab. All of that takes a lot of time. Uh, we have expanded our programs quite a bit. Um, we've really been collecting water quality data for the past 20 years. Um, but the past five years or so, we have expanded that program quite a bit. Um, and I'll speak to more what data we collect and why we share it. Um, but the main thing is, this is one of our best ways to determine where we need to make some changes, where we need to focus on restoration and so on, is all from collecting our data. So the reason we go out and sample um, is to try to find high quality waters. Um, and then those places we can try to protect that and preserve it. But also to see uh, all the tributaries in the river, different inputs that they have so that we can potentially focus on those areas. Um, and we can clearly see in our watershed that the land use um, changes and has a huge impact on water quality. As I'm sure many of you know, water quality starts on the land. And we're, when we're up in the headwaters, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, there's a lot of buffers, it's more forested, and we're seeing very clear, clean, cold water, very pristine water up there. As we go down our watershed, there's more and more inputs, and there's more development pressures along the river. Uh, less buffers, more hard surfaces, leading to more stormwater pollution. Uh, so we can clearly see that change depending on where in the watershed we are. And then all of our data, we use that to identify if there are impairments, try to kind of pinpoint where those are coming from, and use that data that we have to see, okay, is there a problem at this location? What can we do about it? Do we have excessive amounts of road salts coming in in this one spot. What can we do in terms of restoration or changing some practices to make that not the case? Um, so from all of that data and knowledge, then we try to work with a lot of partners and use that information to come up with some restoration. So we're involved in a lot of green infrastructure, mainly rain gardens and buffer plantings to help capture some of that stormwater so we're not getting all those pollutants into our waterways. Um, but like I mentioned, we do have data from, you know, some of these sites from 20 years now. So we can actually look at some of the longer term trends, which is very valuable too, and see the changes over time. Um, and then the past several years, we've been going from flood to drought to flood conditions. And we can use that information to see what are the river flows. We use USGS gauge stations and so on. Um, and just weather information and see how is that affecting our water quality? And is there anything we can do about that as well? Um, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. Um, so then all of this data that we do collect um, we're following our quality assurance project plans, which have been, been approved by the state of Connecticut and also Massachusetts. Two separate ones, they're slightly different based on the state requirements for that. 
and we submit all of our data now through the EPA Water Quality Exchange portal. Um, I think if you create account, I think other folks can take a look at that data as well. So you can see um, anyone's data across the nation who has been entering it in there. And both state agencies, Connecticut, um, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and also Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection pulls data from that when they are working on their integrated water quality reports. So that's been um, the best way of late for them to get that data. Um, we also email them and let them know our data is up there. They have certain deadlines and so on for all of that. Um, and then they use that information to designate if this certain tributary or section of the river um, has habitat for fish and aquatic life can support that recreation and also fish consumption. And they also use it to develop TMDLs, total maximum daily loads for specific pollutants. Um, next slide. So the, the largest program that we have in terms of water quality monitoring is our bacteria monitoring. This is something we've been doing the longest and we have the most sites within the Farmington River and its tributaries. Uh, we are up to, I think, 59 sites. So we have several routes where we go out during the summer recreational season, generally May through September. We rotate the sites <clears throat> every other week and take uh, grab samples at each site. And then we bring that back to our lab. We actually have lab space in the town that our office is in um, by the Simsbury Pollution Control Facility. Um, which is, has been great. During COVID, we did have to use the USGS lab, but it's great for us to be able to use our own lab space for bacteria monitoring and also for us to train our interns there. And the reason we do uh, bacteria monitoring, mainly E. coli, is because, first of all, there's a health risk associated with that. Um, so it's important to know that and we share this information publicly but also because it's a great indicator and it's fairly easy and inexpensive to monitor for. And if we're seeing high levels of bacteria, that means we're also getting a lot of stormwater runoff and therefore probably um, other issues such as extra nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, um, potentially extra road salts. It just means it's, there's more input coming into that location so then we can go, once we see an area that has some problems, we can go and um, look into it a little bit deeper. We also have a multi-parameter meter to take other measurements. And sometimes we take nutrient measurements and send that off to a university's laboratory to analyze. So that's kind of the starting point can give us kind of uh, the heartbeat of what's happening at that location. Um, and as I mentioned, all of our methods have been approved by the state agencies. So they're very confident that they can accept our data and it's it's up to snuff. Um, and <clears throat> we also submit that onto Connecticut Rivers Conservancy is its clean website. So the public can see that too. Um, and they have other data up there, which has been great for our partners if they wanna see what's going on. You know, there's a little lag time, um, but it, it's nice to, have that publicly facing as well. And in general, you know, the, the reason that we try to do a lot of this monitoring is not for just our own use and our own ideas of where we could potentially do a restoration project or, you know, encourage in terms of kind of education, um, but it's also because the state agencies don't have the capacity to monitor everywhere um, and they are interested in this data and the best way we've um, been able to work with the state agencies is having open communication, setting up meetings and outright asking, you know, where do you need data? Where's that lacking? And how can we help you and support you so that more attention is focused on the areas that we are worried about as well? Uh, next slide, please. So this is something that's um, come up more recently, and I'm sure many of you are aware of the problems of this. Um, 
cyanobacteria, it's also known as um, harmful algae blooms, blue-green algae. It's naturally occurring everywhere, um, but the problem comes when we actually have blooms, and about 25% of the time that we have a bloom, it can be toxic. And there's a bunch of different toxins it can produce, very harmful to public health, um, and also to wildlife, and actually, especially to dogs. Um, if they get in water that looks green, like you see in this photo, lick their fur, there's been a lot of pretty quick um, deaths, kidney failure from, from that. So very concerning. Uh, this is happening all over the world more and more frequently because of climate change. And um, <clears throat> Rainbow Reservoir is on the Farmington River itself, near the very end of our watershed. So this is also kind of a clear indication that the more development you have, the less buffers you have, the more inputs also from wastewater treatment facilities. We have nine in our watershed, um, the more problems arise. So we have a situation here where there's a dam on the river and pounding it. So first of all, holding a lot of water back, making it move slower. In times of drought, there's less water, there's less flow, less movement and warmer temperatures so that water can heat up more. Um, that combined with extra nutrients, in particular phosphorus, can lead to a uh, cyanobacteria bloom, which is very bad for aquatic life as well. And um, we were contacted by a camp that's on the site saying, we've had these blooms, the health department at times has told us, can't Stop. 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 with the, um, with the water and they're like, what can we do about this? So they reached out to us. Uh, we were able to apply for a state grant. Connecticut has a aquatic invasive species grant program that they more recently added cyanobacteria as one of the, um, one of the things to potentially have grant funding from. And um, we received that for a couple of rounds and that was kind of the start of us working with a limnologist going out on a motorboat, taking samples for algae, for nutrients, using our multi-parameter meter for other parameters, um, taking some sediment samples as well to try to figure out why is it blooming, what's causing it, and, and what can we potentially do about this? Um, and you know, mainly we've seen in years with heavy rains, there's enough flushing that we're not getting blooms but in years of droughts, we're getting blooms. And that's because of the amount of extra nutrients, particularly when the nitrogen ratio with the phosphorus ratio changes, there's more phosphorus, um, then you end up having more cyanobacteria blooms. Whereas if it's more balanced or more nitrogen, you can potentially have other algae blooms that aren't potentially toxic. Um, so the state's been very interested in this and we submit all of our data but we also write um, reports and share that information, which is sometimes a little more easy to digest instead of just a bunch of data points. We're actually explaining what we're seeing and potentially what we could do about this. The state has been very interested in trying to figure out the relationship between blooms and toxic levels um, and pollutants. Um, and we also work pretty closely with University of Connecticut. There's a lot of research going on there. And I think the, the best thing to do about this is try to connect with other partners, share as much information as possible as well. Um, and a little bit of a, a citizen science aspect is the state and others are very interested in getting reports on this. So this is you know one known location for us that we know there are blooms quite often. Um, but there's many other small lakes and ponds that can be having this too. So um, people can download this app that EPA actually created called Bloom Watch. Um, so if you ever see kind of this green, green um, color, sometimes they can be red too, um, but in any kind of unusual situation, you can actually update that. And I know that this, at least the state of Connecticut, probably many other states, are interested in, in collecting this data. Uh, next slide. So continuous monitoring 
Um, we have in-stream loggers. Uh, we've been doing this for temperature for quite some time. We work with um, onset, they're called hobos. Very easy to use, pretty cost effective as well. And the nice thing about using these loggers is we can't be everywhere at once. And I'm sure there's other small organizations out there that want to collect more data, but you just don't have the manpower, even with interns or volunteers. And this is a great way to collect more data, especially after you've been out, you've sampled, maybe taken some grab samples at certain locations and been like, oh, this one site really is showing some issues, would like to look at it longer term. Um, so in the past, we had just the temperature loggers um, for cold water tributaries. The Farmington River watershed um, has a great trout fishery um, because of cold water releases from some upstream dams. And uh, this has made it just kind of very prominent for a lot of people that are interested in fishing. The state stocks it as well. Um, and there's, you know, the economics tied with that too when people come out to visit the Farmington River for fishing. So we're also trying to identify cold water habitat that could potentially be good for uh, trout species. So looking at various tributaries and the state is very interested in that um, data as well. And we deploy these loggers at certain sites. They take um, data every hour, year round. So we take them out um, in the spring, swap them again in the fall and then upload all of that data. Um, then we more recently started doing this with um, connectivity loggers to uh, determine the chloride. Again, we kind of started with, um, you can actually go to the next slide, it explains a little bit better there. So um, we started kind of doing these grab samples. Um, Isaac Walton League of America has a great program called Salt Watch, a kind of citizen science program. We just started with that. Um, we had some long-term data from grab samples of a certain segment of the river on uh, chloride. And we've noticed a long-term trend of slow and steadily increasing. And as I'm sure many of you know, throughout the United States, salt road salt use since the 90s has gone up like you wouldn't believe. So it's certainly affecting our rivers, it's affecting our groundwater as well. So we started with that. Um, and then with our meter would go out and, and take readings year round. Um, and then at certain sites where we notice kind of higher levels of, of issues, then we started deploying connectivity loggers. The nice thing about that is that, you know, we try to get out before a storm event and then right after to see the effects of all that washing in. Um, when you have the logger, you're getting that all of that data so you can see those spikes. So areas that were at that kind of um, critical for affecting aquatic life and aquatic plants, those are the areas which deployed those loggers. They're a little bit more pricey, but they also take temperature as well. So that's a great way to collect more data. Um, and again, we, we share all this data too. I know that the state is very interested in this as of late. Um, and it's even come to the, the um, there's one particular case. And I kind of like to explain this because it shows how the public nonprofit organizations and state agencies can really work together on an issue is the public had made a bunch of comments about a certain lake and the fish dying there and being a lot of issues. So the state had all this input for them, started looking at that location. And we have been looking at this tributary that feeds into this and notice really high chloride levels. Um, so we had some meetings with the state and they were very interested in that. So it kind of the public spurred the state to focus in on a certain area. We then provided more data to back that up. And this is a, like a shopping plaza. So a lot of parking lots, they were storing salt there that was leaching off um, into the river. And then we as a nonprofit, we can explain 
and encourage our partners and municipalities and so on to make changes, but we can't in, you know, change regulations or do enforcement. So that's where it's really nice to have that partnership. And you know, we have promoted what is called Green Snow Pro. It's a training with the local university that allows municipalities to learn about smart ways to apply road salts. Um, and so on. And there are other programs, I think Wisconsin has one too, um, to kind of encourage municipalities and private contractors to use less road salt, use it more appropriately, use the salt brine and so on. So there's way, ways to make some changes there. Next slide, please. And then the final thing is macroinvertebrate surveys. Also a great way to be involved in citizen science. Um, I know Isaac Walton League has a program. Um, the state of Connecticut does, but a lot of other states don't. So we um, here at the office are trained in this, so we can do that with other volunteers. We look for potentially high quality tributaries, riffles out in the fall. We do the surveys and then send the samples themselves directly to the state so that they can identify that, um, make sure those um, certain species were found. And they're almost like their own loggers in a way. If you find certain species that are not very tolerant to pollution being there, then you know that there's never been some extreme spikes um, if they were able to survive that. So that's been a great program as well. I'm personally not quite as involved in that, um, but that's a, been a very fun educational opportunity as well. Um, yeah, so that those are kind of our main water quality programs. And then again, all this information we share, and we do have confirmation that it is being used in the integrated water quality reports. Um, and also, we, we write up reports and share that to the state agencies, and also to our partners. And we have partners, for example, the wild and scenic committees, that they sometimes have funding um, that can help move a project forward, a restoration project, such as a buffer planting, a rain garden, or to do some of these trainings. Um, and then also having a good partnership with um, all of the municipalities too. And some are easier than others uh, to work with, but that can make a big impact and actually make some of these things change once we have the data to back it up. And next slide. So yeah, that's kind of the quick overview. Um, I, you know, I'm happy to answer the questions as best I can. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, we have a number of questions. Um, I can start. Matt Terry asks, what method do you use for measuring bacteria? Is Coloquant accepted by Connecticut DEP, D Mass DEP, and EPA? Two part question. So, so we use the uh, IDEX Cololert system. Um, so we're taking grab samples um, a certain way, which is described in our CLAP and approved. And we go back to the lab and we use the Cololert 24 hour system, which I think um, a lot of others do use. It's a pretty common one. So they incubate for 24 hours and you read those results um, and share that data. Um, and yes, that's accepted by uh, Connecticut DEEP and also by Massachusetts DEP. And then I saw Christina ask, what is your testing interval and do you have a set of standard locations? Yeah, so um, we test through May to September um, for bacteria, for example. So chloride's a little different because we're out there in the winter as well as the summer. Um, but for most of our sampling, it's May through September and it's every other week. So we have a set schedule. We're not doing dry sampling and wet sampling. That's just um, too difficult schedule wise with the number of sites we have. So we go out at specific times um, 
every other week for each site. So we're out, um, you know, twice a week, every single week, we're just rotating all of those sites. Um, and then we do add some kind of extra information, like what was the weather recently? Um, what's the current weather? Uh, things like that too, so that we can kind of have those notes and compare, you know, we have observations as well, so we can kind of compare that. Um, and then we have a kind of a base set of locations that we've been sampling over a long time. Um, and then we add in new locations um, depending on if there's areas that we're interested in or if there's been more development in a certain area and we want to keep an eye on it, then we'll add some sites in. See another one um, asking, do you still have to calibrate your hobo water level loggers with atmospheric pressure? So um, our temperature loggers, and this is not something I do, this is pages category, so I'll try to explain it as best I can. Our temperature loggers, we do have to calibrate with cold water using certain thermometers and so on. So we do that um, before we deploy them. And the connectivity loggers, we have to also calibrate. I'm not sure on the exact procedure. I can ask her on how she does that. Um, but then when we're trying to convert that into understanding how much chloride, we do it dependent on each site because there can be different inputs from groundwater. So not every site is the same. There's a calculation for that. And I'm happy to share that um, if you want to follow up in an email. Um, but then we only have one log water level logger. This is very new to us. Um, but yes, it has an air logger as well component to it. So you do have to calibrate it. The water level logger, which we have one of, it's um, to cal to determine flow. Um, there is that atmospheric pressure. So that one's a little trickier to deal with, but we've found some pretty interesting results with that. And we've also actually used some cameras too to collect data. And, you know, we have a measurement point and then you can see how much the flow is going up and down. But in general with water level and flow, we're just using the USGS gauge stations, which there are a number of on our river, thankfully, but there could be more. So Matt, comes back with, are, do, are you monitoring any fish? So we're not, mostly because of capacity. Um, the state does, um, and they've shared that data with us. So then we have that information of, you know, where are there some native trout species? Um, and we can kind of overlay that with restoration projects too, especially in terms of, we also do um, stream road, stream crossing assessments. So looking at culverts that pose a barrier to fish migration. Um, so that data with temperature data and everything else can kind of lead us to encouraging the town or the state, whoever owns that culvert and try to improve that. So that's something else we work on, but we don't ourselves monitor fish. And then I see a question from Ray asking, is there any pre-settlement history of all live migrations in the watershed and any efforts to return those annual migrations? Yes. So um, through some other organizations, including Save the Sound, um, there, has, there has been historic runs of um, alewife, blue-black heron, um, American eel and even Atlantic salmon in the Farmington River before it was dammed. So be the, below the confluence of the Farmington River all the way to Connecticut, there's no dams. So the Farmington River could be a great candidate for returning those migratory species. Unfortunately, there's a dam just eight miles off of the confluence on the Farmington River. Uh, it's an old dam, it's aging, it's about a hundred years old. They've tried in the past to have some fish ways on there. They have not been effective. They've actually been very harmful. So the state shut that fish way down last summer. So we're working with our partners um, to try to remove any barriers, try to create fish passage wherever possible. 
Um, a lot is going further up on the river on those things. Um, but Connecticut has the most dams per river mile than any state in the nation, actually. So it's certainly a challenge. Um, but yes, we, we advocate for fish passage wherever possible, but it's more than just fish passage. It's for all aquatic life, for sediment, all of that movement is important. A river is like, is like yeah. our it's arteries in a way. Here's one from Mary. Being in Utah, your commentary on road salt really hits home. Are you able to share a brief overview of the practices that are proven to be more effective in placing road salt to avoid leaching? And also, I'm curious if you're aware of practices that developers can implement when developing to avoid negative impact to watershed and water resources. Yeah, um, so in terms of applying road salts, um, a lot of it is that, and I'm sure many of you seen, at certain in intersections, the trucks just dump and there's a pile and it's right next to a storm drain. And that's not actually very effective at melting salt and it's costing more for the municipality or whomever is, is spreading the salt. It's much better to kind of have it more sprinkled. It's gonna melt the salt better or the ice, um, but also brines have been, um, have been quite popular and effective as well. So doing kind of a brine, spraying that on the road as, as well, and then being mindful of the location. So I know the state actually purchased some pretty expensive um, equipment to do the calculations of where to put more salt, where to put less salt, um, which has helped, but that's a big expense and that's coming from the state. Um, then, you know, we've just encouraged through some of these trainings to train the municipal the municipalities um, and to train private contractors as well on ways they can reduce it. And the biggest way we've been able to encourage that is saying you're going to save money. That's kind of the bottom line. So um, those those are some of the practices. There's a lot of information out there. If you want to send me an email, I can try to link you up to to others that are working on this more. Um, but you know we we are seeing more and more problems and it's just increasing and it's storing in the groundwater as well. We even have some roads where people's private wells are showing up with um, salt in their drinking water. So it's it's certainly, um, certainly a big issue. And then in terms of developers, um, whenever possible, and it's tricky, we have 33 towns in our watershed and most watersheds have many towns to contend with. Um, we're just seeing more and more development along the floodplains and very sensitive areas and along wetlands and so on. Um, we just try to submit comments saying, you know, you need to address the stormwater on site, try to reduce the amount of hard surfaces, um, try to encourage having rain gardens so that the water coming from the roofs and roadways and all of that is going into um, bioswales or rain gardens or things like that. Um, but it's, it's certainly a tough one to fight. And a lot of that depends on towns, their, you know, what, what they want to decide to do and what they want to decide to, to approve. Um, but I know also on the regulatory side, there's a lot of new things coming out where they're having more stringent rules in terms of development. Um, so hopefully that will help in the future. See another question from Adam asking, can you speak a little bit more about your experience sharing data with the state? Do they require data in a certain format? How do you manage your data for different stakeholders that may have different format needs? Yeah, so this is this is a big one. Um, in the past, they had certain formats, and it was different for Massachusetts than for Connecticut, um, and it kind of wasted a lot of our time trying to fit the data and how we have it into their formats. Thankfully, now they both use and prefer EPA's um, water quality portal. So now it's just one format, uh, which is so much easier, and then they can pull the data from that. Um, and then we use our studio. Um, to run our quality assurance 
um, quality control. And it creates this kind of little report for have we met the parameters that we have listed in our quality assurance project plan, you know, were there kind of any issues. And in that little report, then we can also write comments. Um, if there was something flagged, if we had to censor some data, you know, if something went wrong. Um, so we can kind of quality control all of that. And then we share that report. And then we just now have to email them that report and letting them know that our data has been submitted. They do have different um, dates of when they need this data so that they can use that for, the, it's every two years that they do the integrated water quality report. Um, so it's good to reach out to your state, find out when they need that data and how they need it so you're prepared um, in advance because managing data, especially now with our loggers, we have 200,000 data points. In the past, when it's just been manual data, we've had 5,000. So very, very different scale. Um, the loggers, you know, with all their data points, that really makes it quite a, a big package. Um, so just knowing in advance how you want to show that data. And then in terms of, you know, our other partners that we share this with, um, that's where the reports come in handy because we can also kind of speak to trends over time on certain issues and kind of divide it up by the towns. So we can bring that to the towns and say, hey, this is kind of the water quality snapshot for your tributaries and your section of the river. You know, how can we move forward? And then also, you know, for our other organizations that are interested in this stuff, have more of an informal conversation and it's easier to digest. Um, you know, they're welcome to look at the data if they want, but otherwise it gets overwhelming. Here's one from Christina. What percentage of the water quality work is conducted by staff versus citizen science volunteers? Yeah, so um, the majority is by staff and our trained interns. We have a couple of uh, long-term water quality volunteers. So then they get kind of a training refresher and they go out and do a specific route, the same route each time. Um, and then in terms of citizen science, that's more our macroinvertebrate program. So we involve people in that and then also the salt watch through the Isaac Walton League. And then they can share the data there and we can see that there. Um, but it's also in terms of capacity, it's been you know, we're a smaller organization, it's hard to organize a whole bunch of trainings um, to get volunteers because lots of times these volunteers just want to do it for one season or even just a few days. Um, we have found it, it's a bit harder to find volunteers that want to do it for a long time. So it's it's like weighing the, the um, I guess, the inputs of us trying to train people versus um, who's interested in and so on. But it's always wonderful to get more people involved because then they feel like they're personally connected to their location and they feel like they're doing something positive. And that's just a wonderful thing, um, especially getting youth involved too. So I have another one. This one's from Travis. And Travis asks, how many water parameters are you taking at each site? Is there any groundwater monitoring wells that can be compared to surface water samples? Yeah, so we um, we take a, a grab sample bacteria. Uh, we take, when we have our multi-parameter meter, we're taking dissolved oxygen, uh, turbidity, temperature, conductivity, chloride. Um, and then we have in our field data sheets some just observations if we see some interesting things, um, you know, a, kind of a rough estimate on the levels and so on. And then back in the office, we can add in what the flows were at the nearest gauge station, weather patterns, things like that. Um, a little bit more parameters for special projects like at Rainbow Reservoir, I mentioned, you know, we're also doing nutrient samples there and algae samples and sediment samples. Um, but that's just for that specific area. And then we have shared some of this data with UConn, University of Connecticut, that has 
um, access some data from groundwater, and they've actually been looking at um, legacy nitrogen leaching out of, of uh, groundwater sources, which has been really interesting, and also um, PFOS as well. So kind of sharing the data with that, we haven't been um, able to monitor any groundwater wells ourselves, um, but just sharing that with the university that is, um, there was also a spill of PFOS. Um, so there's one of the towns that's monitoring some of those um, well sites as well to see um, how is that moving and is if it's moving towards from groundwater towards a tributary that we're concerned about if that's showing up there. Okay, let's see. Do you um, have a platform for sharing the data using an interactive map? So, um, not quite. I mean, we are sharing our data on Connecticut River Conservancy's website. Is it clean? Um, but that's not the best visual. We have started creating some maps. Um, but we don't really have anything interactive. So you can see the locations, um, but that's something we need to hire somebody to help us with that. But that's a very nice visual and we're always looking at you know, other ways we can visually represent what we're finding because that's easier for the general public um, to understand. The state does have some interactive maps and they use our um, temperature data for example, on one of their maps. So you can look that up and that's interactive, but they're not super quick in uploading it. I think the last data that they've actually uploaded on that from us has been in 2020. Um, so there's a bit of a lag just because of the capacity. And then... Last one, Bud was asking if uh, you can say a little more about legacy nitrates or maybe yeah, um, to point towards or. So I can um, connect you with the researchers at University of Connecticut that are doing that work. Um, for more specifics, it's it's very interesting to see what's coming out. So part of this is kind of from land use. We've had a lot of agriculture in the past along our river corridor. Um, and they are seeing, you know, kind of hot spots. They use these like thermal cameras um, and they can see the difference in the temperatures of the groundwater coming out. And then they're taking samples there and they have been seeing extra um, nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and also PFOS as well. That's a separate study, um, but it all ties in. And I know they were looking at a number of um, like old town dumps as well to see what was leaching off from there into the groundwater and then showing up in the river. Um, and there've also been some studies on some insects and spiders, um, very interesting stuff that they're picking up when they're finding at these certain locations. So there's a lot of very cool research going on about that, um, but not something that we're directly involved in. So feel free to reach out and I can send you the contacts at, at the university about that. It's very interesting stuff. I have a question, Laura. So um, the, the sampling that you do, you analyze it, and for sure, bacteria and and maybe if you're dealing with algae requires some time before you know what you've just sampled, you know, the, the levels. And where there are people recreating and you mentioned uh, folks walking their dogs. Is there, it, I think that it's hard to be predictive in those modelings, but do you use those predictively? That's not the right word, but so that you know you you you'd love to be able to say today it's red green or yellow today it's bad tomorrow right. all you all you know for sure is yesterday was bad but ha, you know so how do you deal with that particularly with someone who might walk their dog today and it's going to be okay and tomorrow it won't be okay because it's crossed the threshold right yeah so this is tricky um one thing of note is that there's no like official 
designated swimming anywhere on the Farmington River. So they don't have to deal with the same stuff that the state does on some of the, the state beaches where they have to report and do quick tests. Um, but in general, what we see is right after a heavy rainstorm, the bacteria levels are going to spike. So kind of general rules is, especially if we haven't had much rain in a while and all of a sudden we do everything that's just been sitting out there on the pavement, washes into storm drains, is ending up in the water. So the worst time to go into the water or recreate along it is after an event like that in terms of bacteria and other pollutants. Um, also, when we have had an extended drought, it tends to be higher too because there's just less volume of water. So the concentrations tend to be a little bit higher. Um, and then in terms of cyanobacteria, where like if you're walking your dog and it can potentially be toxic, um, water is pretty much, you should be able to see some sort of a bloom. Um, but again, in drought conditions, that's when it's much more likely to have a cyanobacteria blooms. So if we've had a lot of rain, that problem is not gonna be as much of a problem. Um, but yeah, at any time you see anything that looks unusual in the water, you know, you want to avoid it. And, um, you know, Department of Public Health and so on and town agencies, they'll put up postings sometimes, so for example, on Rainbow Reservoir, where there's um, a boat launch and people can boat. They have posted warning signs about this. And unfortunately, you still see the public going out on boats. And uh, cyanobacteria can actually get into the air if it gets sprayed up and you can actually breathe it in and cause some harm uh, just from that. And we've seen people like jet skiing out when it's super green water. And mm. fortunately, what can you do about that? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but certain weather patterns certainly will, will give you an indication of if it's safe or not. And then certain locations, you know, we know there's areas that are just almost show zero all the time and are just pristine um, because of their their buffers and the land use around them. All right, thank you. I don't think we have more questions. I think you've run out of questions. Great, well, thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. and. Um, you know, feel free to to reach out if you have any questions and or any ideas of, of what we can do and, and other ways to work with partners is always welcomed. Well, thank you so much, Laura. This is a lot of great information. Um, and just a reminder for everyone, we will be sending this out. We'll also be posting it on our YouTube channel. So you can subscribe and it'll let you know when it's live. Also, we have some uh, events coming up. One in particular tomorrow is the Hydropower Insights webinar series is going to begin. It's a four-part series. I'll put a link in the chat um, to the River Training Center webpage where you can go find out some more about these two different events. We're also going to have another one next Wednesday. Uh, both a hydropower thing and a wild and scenic river series. So lots of stuff going on with the River Training Center. And then lastly, I have a survey form here uh, that I'm going to share here in the chat. And uh, would love to hear your thoughts about today's session. So please take a moment. I think it's just five questions should be pretty quick. And uh, let us know what you thought. So... Thank you again. And if you have any other questions uh, about the roundtables, feel free to reach out. Yeah, thank you, Laura, again so much for presenting today. Thank you so much for having me.